Education Monday, Education Monday on the Tribal Root Studio with Alina Zahil. They are just giving you a truth. They are not giving you real independence. Changing mindsets in Africa, making a world better. Together, we can make a difference. We are fixing Africa. Education Monday. Education Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome back to the Tribal Root Studio located in Ishaka Mushenyi and we are fixing Africa is always what we tell you and we say wake up Africa because we understand and know that by waking up we'll be able to better our land, to better our communities, to better ourselves and also to heal our people. So this is the Tribal Roots once again but before I proceed I would like to ask all of you to subscribe to this channel. Also remember to hit the bell button so you can always get notifications whenever we upload new episodes and my name is Alina Zahir and I welcome you to this show once again and we call this the Education Monday where we say we are changing mindsets because we believe a lot of our people are still sleeping, a lot of our people are still carrying the wrong mindset and it is very wrong because having the wrong mindset has kept us in this situation. We all need to get up at once. Think on the same line, align with the same energy and make sure we can take the right steps to healing Africa and to bettering Africa. So today we are talking about the Congo and you all know what has been happening in the Congo and in case you do not know I would like to remind you that this is one country that has been going through wars and wars and conflict after conflict having different rebel groups in the same nation. Everyone is trying to struggle to get something out of the Congo. Everyone is trying to get a peace Everyone is trying to get a piece of the Congo and we want to see and look deep into these things and recently there's something that happened and we would like to say the significance of this event that happened recently whereby the tooth of the former charismatic leader was brought back to the nation for burial in an event that had the family of this leader and some of the Belgian, Belgian uh, representatives coming with a coffin carrying a tooth, a tooth of the former leader for burial. This event speaks so much to us and this event needs to be scrutinized and we need to ask uh, this question. What do we gain from the return of the tooth that was taken after the killing of this charismatic strongest and pan-Africanist leader who was trying to make sure that the Congo becomes free? Everyone needs to remember also that this great man was killed a few months after Congo got its independence in which he was very instrumental. He fought tooth and nail until the Congo was free from colonialism but he didn't live long to see the independence that he was fighting for and it is also ironic that even after that the Congo has never known any peace. Everyone also needs to recall that the Congo is the richest nation in the world with the richest mineral resources. This is how important the Congo is. But today I want us all to look at the Congo in a very special way and remember that colonialism never ended. Colonialism and slavery never ended and all the talks and education uh, books that have been given to us telling us how colonialism ended can, can now be thrown away and now we can know that the colonialism they said ended never ended because with the example of the Congo we see that Everything that happened before independence is happening to this day. Everything that happened through the different groups and factions fighting each other for power is still happening today. If there was displacement of the people in the past, it is even worse today. If we had nations taking part in supporting different rebel groups for the mineral resources in Congo, it is still happening. And the Congo is just an example of all the other nations of Africa where we see conflict like Nigeria, like Cameroon. We have seen these conflicts in Chad. We have seen these conflicts uh, in Sierra Leone. We have seen this in Somalia. We have seen this in Sudan and many other nations. So we have seen the destruction of Libya to, to, to the ground, like they had to kill and destroy and put Libya off the map. Also, we need to remember that every time we speak about African unity and Africa uh, wake up, we are also reminding you 
you that we are all Africans, regardless of where we come from. Because when we speak about colonialism and slavery, we should also remember that the boundaries and these lines and these names that we have for these nations were all given to us by the people we say we got rid of. Everyone says we got rid of colonialism, but we are still Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania. I mean, these are names they gave us. We didn't have these names. They are not our names. There was no nation called Uganda before colonialism. There was no nation called Kenya before colonialism. And now, looking at what has just happened in the Congo, the return of the tooth to be buried in the Congo, we should also remember that there were people like Lumumba in all these small other nations that were killed and we don't even know where they were buried. If you remember the good uh, fighters of Kenya, if you remember those men that fought against colonialism in Kenya, no one knows where they were buried. Some of the greatest kings that died in exile, we don't know where they were buried. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example of uh, the king of uh, Bunyoro Chitara Kingdom, who was also as good as all these great fighters that fought against colonialism. No one knows if he was buried where. No one knows where he was buried because he died in exile. So these are the issues. And we are now looking at a very great man in Africa that fought against colonialism and us having to take over the legacy or to inherit their legacy and also emulate them by our actions is going to be very hard if we don't bring up the history and teach the children and teach the children of the children that this is how these men stood for Africa, fought for Africa, died for Africa. And now we need to change this narrative because this is the truth about what happened in the Congo. Watch this video that is following so that everyone can know that this is how it happened. Congo eventually achieved its independence on the 30th of June 1960 after a shaky coalition of 12 different parties agreed to a power sharing arrangement. Congo began life as an independent state with a 35 year old Patrice Lumumba as its first prime minister and Lumumba's arch rival Joseph Kazavubu appointed as non executive president. But like a young deer thrust into a den of hungry lions, Lumumba's Congo would be ripped apart before it could even find its feet. Violence and chaos in the Congo. Barely 11 days after official independence from Belgium, Congolese troops mutiny and begin a wave of attacks and looting throughout the far-flung sectors of the former colony. Meanwhile, in Belgium and in African countries bordering on the Congo, refugees are pouring in with harrowing tales of violence and of hasty flight. At least 10 Europeans were reported killed in a weekend of violence, with armed clashes in the key cities of Elizabethville, Stanleyville and Luaburg, which was to be the new nation's capital. At the request of Congolese officials, Belgian paratroops were recalled to quell the native army's mutiny and reign of terror, a harsh awakening to reality from golden dreams of independence. Within its first seven days as an independent state, an army revolt would break out into a fully-fledged civilian massacre as Lumumba's government struggled to control the situation. Sensing blood, opposition parties immediately began questioning the legitimacy of Lumumba's government and a number of secessionist groups began threatening to rip the country apart. You see, Lumumba's MNC had actually only won 33 of the total 137 seats in the new Congolese parliament. Although this was the largest single total of any other political party, nearly half of all of the MNC's votes came from just one province in Stanleyville and it had very limited support in the capital and other major regions. With the outbreak of chaos, Lumumba's rivals in the resource-rich Katanga and South Kasai regions spotted an opportunity to grab power for themselves and immediately began trying to secede from the newly independent Congo. Also looking to protect their own interests, Belgian operatives began collaborating with the Katangese rebels as they saw Katanga as a base from which they could eventually topple Lumumba's government and establish a pro-Belgium unified Congolese government in the country's capital of Leopoldville.
By the end of its second week as an independent state, Congo was in a critical condition. Internal security had completely collapsed, the army was in disarray, the white minority of Belgian civil servants, doctors and teachers began fleeing to Belgium, and the rebels of Katanga and South Kasai continued threatening to break the country apart. In desperation, Lumumba dismissed all Belgian officers in the army and appointed his former personal aide Joseph Mobutu as army chief of staff. Although Mobutu had only received basic military training during his seven years in the colonial army, his ability to gain Lumumba's trust had just earned him his first major victory on the road to absolute power. As the crisis got from bad to worse, Lumumba publicly accused the Belgians of being at the heart of the crisis and appealed to the United Nations for help. Dissatisfied with the UN's response, Lumumba hastily turned to the Soviet Union for military assistance in his desperate attempt to restore internal order. And unfortunately for him, this move would ultimately prove to be his undoing. You see, Lumumba had long been on the CIA's watch list as a suspected communist sympathizer, and with his appointment as Congo's Prime Minister, Washington had been on high alert against the threat of increased Soviet influence in the Congo. And so with his appeal to the Soviet Union, the Americans felt that their suspicions about Lumumba had now been confirmed. Lumumba's actions would bring both Belgian and US interests into perfect alignment, and having agreed on the need to get rid of Lumumba, the only remaining question was about how to go about it. The perfect man for the job would be none other than Lumumba's newly appointed army chief of staff. Where most people saw chaos, Mobutu saw a golden opportunity. The Congolese crisis would be for him the perfect way to fast track his long-term political ambitions. By aligning himself to American and Belgian interests, Mobutu realized that he could use their military might to consolidate power for himself and create a perfectly symbiotic relationship between him and two of the world's most powerful countries. And so while Lumumba continued to accuse the Belgians of sabotage and desperately tried to rally up nationalist spirit, Mobutu publicly accused Lumumba of being a communist sympathizer and blamed him for the disorder in the Congolese army. Acting in collaboration with President Kazavubu, the Belgians and the Americans, Mobutu would go on to arrange for the capture and secret execution of the very same man that had brought him to the corridors of power. A new chapter begins in the dark and tragic history of the Congo with the return to Leopoldville of deposed Premier Lamumba, following his capture by crack commandos of strongman Colonel Mobutu. Taken to Mobutu's headquarters, past a jeering, threatening crowd, Lamumba was impassive at this lowest ebb of his stormy career. Mobutu watched as his troops manhandled Lamumba, but promised the pro-red Lamumba a fair trial on charges of inciting the army to rebellion. Lamumba was removed to an army prison outside the capital as his supporters in Stanleyville seized control of Oriental province and threatened a return of disorder. Before that, Lumumba suffered more indignities, including being forced to eat a speech which he restated his claim to be the Congo's rightful premier. Even in bonds, Lumumba remains a dangerous prisoner, storm center of savage loyalties and equally savage opposition. With Lumumba out of the picture, Mobutu turned its focus to forcefully crushing the Katangese and South Kasai rebellions, as well as a separate Lumumba-inspired rebellion that arose in Stanleyville shortly after his death. And after over four years of heavy fighting, Mobutu's US-backed forces successfully quelled all rebellions and restored power to the central government in Leopoldville. As a show of gratitude for his services to the nation, President Kazavubu promoted Mobutu to the rank of Major General, which in the year 1965 was the highest rank for an officer in the Congolese army. 
But by this point, Mobutu's deep connections and access to US and Belgian firepower had basically made him more powerful than both his president and his prime minister. Just six days after his appointment as Major General, Mobutu finally formalized his status as the most powerful man in Congo when he dismissed both the president and prime minister in a relatively straightforward military coup. Immediately moving to instill fear in the hearts of the public, Mobutu ordered the hanging of four of Kazavubu's former ministers in front of a crowd of over 50,000 spectators. With this bold and brutal spectacle, Mobutu sent a clear message to all his potential rivals. So you can now see that the Belgian government and America were very instrumental in the killing of Patrice Lumumba. The main reason for this is because everyone was fighting against uh, this man that was standing and saying we are defending Congo in all its entirety, we are defending Congo and we need sovereignty in everything. If you also remember, Mobutu, after taking over power with all the support he had from America, he tried to position himself as a Pan-Africanist who wanted to uh, make Congo uh, Africa again, who, who tried to make sure that people think that he's trying to Africanize the Congo. If you remember in those years, I don't, most, most of us were probably not yet born, but I mean, when I was young, I remember there was something about the dresses of the Congo. We had these bitangers, uh, uh, we call them bitangers in my, in my country. And then also we had the music, the music of the Congolese people was everywhere, everywhere in all the surrounding nations. And it somehow tried to tell us that the president of the Congo is the reason why these people are living like Africans. They are trying to sing African music and they are trying to dress like Africans. But the question is, how can you be African by the way of dressing or by the singing or the dancing Why you don't have power over your land? You have no power over your minerals. You have no power over your governance. You have no say over your systems. But you dress and dance and sing Africa. And then this is the feel good sense you give to everyone. That we are supposed to be happy because we are singing African songs. We are supposed to be happy because we are dressing like Africans. We are supposed to be happy because we are speaking an African language. Without the land, without the power over the minerals. We have no power. We are as powerless as dead dogs. So I am saying that the Congo's return of the tooth for so many of us may mean so much. But in real sense, we need to see that this sign is the same of the signs they will use to try and say we are cleaning ourselves. The Belgian government is trying to clean up and trying to say we need to uh, apologize and we need to own to our mistakes and we need to say sorry we need to say all these good things to make sure that people know that we acknowledge we did these mistakes but the belgian government is not ready for reparations the belgian government is not ready to fix the very problems it created the belgian government is not ready to address the conflict that is in the congo today which actually came from the first time the Belgian government said Congo is our colony. Everyone should remember that when they sat in the Berlin conference, when they sat in, the, in Germany in the Berlin conference, everyone was trying to get a piece of Africa. And Belgium chose to get the Congo for the minerals. And everyone should remember King Leopold King Leopold killed more than 10 million Africans during that time. And every time they talk about slavery, they talk about it in a very light way. They don't even classify it as a holocaust. But slavery and colonialism constitutes more than a holocaust because one person like King Leopold was able to murder and butcher more than 10 million people in Africa. And no one paid for that and no one is ready for that discussion and no one wants to address it 
and this is the evils that they have done to us. And the most hurting thing is, they haven't stopped one bit. They haven't stopped doing what they were doing. Even though they are doing these things in very sophisticated ways, in subtle ways, they are still doing the same kind of damage they've done in the past. Supporting dictators. If there is any dictator in Africa that they are pointing at, they are still supporting that dictator. They want every reason to keep in Africa. They will support one dictator with a lot of funding and money and training and weapons. Then they will support the opposition and say, you need to fight that dictator because he's, he's violating human rights. So as long as you don't see this truth, you're fighting against each other, the opposition parties, and then you have the ruling parties fighting each other and wasting a lot of time and thinking you're making any headway. And the colonialist is the same person who is powering and funding all these power struggles that never end and the cycle keeps continuing and repeating itself. And we are not getting anything from this. We are not getting anything good from this. So people need to wake up to the realities of colonialism. It needs to be spoken about. It needs to be, the noise needs to be amplified. We need to speak it on the mountains and tell the world that colonialism is still here, well, alive and well. Colonialism has never ended. Through the corporations, through the banks, through all these World Bank, IMF, all these great organizations, through the debts and the loans that they are putting in Africa. This is how colonialism is happening. So recently we have heard there is a struggle between some army, I mean some rebel groups, and they will tell you this, the M23, and every nation around the Congo is saying, we are not the ones who are powering the M23. But these guys are powered with a lot of good and very sophisticated ammunition. And it's coming from some country in the West, and no one is ready for that discussion. This is how colonialism is happening, and this is how they are doing it. And this is exactly how they managed to kill Patrice Lumumba. They are not going to kill these other leaders who bent their demands or who agreed to sign those agreements on behalf of everyone. They are not going to kill those ones. But if we have leaders that stand up and challenge the status quo and talk about these things, and in all truth, they are going to come after those leaders to kill them. We even have some of our own people who have been brainwashed, especially those people who have left Africa and are living in the West. Uh, we call, those people we call the, the land, friends. Most of them, whenever they open their mouth, you get surprised. Because every time they open their mouth, they are judging their brothers and sisters and saying, Africa is the way it is because of you. You don't care, you, you're not land. You're corrupt, you're tribalistic. They are blaming us for staying in Africa and trying to face things boldly and trying to not run away. So most of these people who are brainwashed and learned in courts, they always tell us, no, the wars in Africa have nothing to do with the world. They have nothing to do with globalization. They have nothing to do with the West. It is you guys. You don't, you don't know what to do. The same called so-called land people are the very instruments that colonialists have. They are the power that they have to keep defending colonialism without even knowing it is. They keep defending colonialism and imperialism without being aware that this is what they are doing. Because they have lost touch with the reality. They have lost touch with the real history. And the real truth is, the kind of history that has been told to these people is the wrong side of the story. I mean, it is the side that was written by the enemy who conquered. It is the hunter's story. It is not the hunted's story. If the hunted could tell the story, we would change a lot of hearts. So we have great Africans that stood up and fought against colonialism and 90% of the time they were killed. And there was always people apologizing and defending and saying, yeah, the killing was justified. And this is what we are facing. So how many years have gone since 1961? 
the Belgian government is coming out and saying, oh, we made a mistake. We are sorry. So you can have your tooth. Wow. They are just giving you a tooth. They are not giving you real independence. They are not giving you power over your minerals. They are not letting you negotiate. They are not giving you the power to decide what's best for your country. But they are giving you a tooth and we think this is a victory. And also everyone needs to remember that this tooth, the return of the tooth, was initiated by the family of Lumumba. And they paid a high cost. They had to take legal means. They have taken a legal process. It means the Belgian government did not on its own come out and say, we want to do this as an act of atonement. They say they didn't do that. I mean, they were pestered to do it by this family. So this means there is so much to uncover. There is so much to atone for. But we need to remember that the West or the colonialists, they have no obligation to us. Knowing who they are and knowing who they have been, we have every obligation to ourselves to defend and save Mother Africa. This is the Tribal Root Studio. Once again, my name is Alina Zahir, and I would like to thank you for being a part of this show. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment. Let us know your mind, and if there's anything you would like us to address, we are ready to be contacted anytime, any day. And you can reach us through our uh, email addresses, through the WhatsApp number that happens to appear in the description of this video. We want to thank everyone that's participated and we want to thank everyone that has supported this channel by all means, morally, financially, and by the contributions you make for the content that we create. We thank you so much. Once again, my name is Alina Zahir and I would like to say peace and blessings.